Welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, joined by the head basketball coach, Mike Bray. Coach, when you think about this season, 24 wins, you get a couple of NCAA tournament wins, round of 32. I have to imagine it's hard to think of this season as anything else but a success. We came a long way from four and five, Tony, back in December. I, I am so proud of the group, and it was an honor to coach them. And did they give us a ride, mm -hmm. not only in the regular season, but man, in March Madness. Just a little bit of everything. And uh, now that I've had a little time to reflect, it's uh, powerful, powerful memories. We're gonna have a chance to obviously break down all the games and relive all the great moments. But to get back in the tournament for the first time in five years, as a coach, to see the way they gave you that ride, those three games in five days, just what were you most proud of? What do you think back and reflect on most as maybe the most exciting part of that run? Well, the, the leadership to get us back was the key. We needed to be back. We needed to regain our momentum here. We're very proud of our program and our program is very respected out there, mm -hmm. college basketball. Um, but the leadership of our captains and our old guys setting the tone and chasing this goal of being part of it, and then not being just happy with getting the bid, mm -hmm. wanting to play as long as we could. Um, we maxed it out. Mm -hmm. We emptied the tank. In the locker room after the Texas Tech game, we were physically and emotionally drained and just about laying on the floor. It's all you could ask. Coach, appreciate it. When we come back, we'll break down the final five games of the Notre Dame men's basketball season, including their postseason run. This is the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's game breakdown. Coach, you've got a lot of games to break down. The last time we talked to you, you were getting set for the final regular season home game of the year against Pittsburgh. So we'll start there. Still a big moment, I think, for this team to wrap up the season at home. You had a chance to finish 14-1 and at home, send your seniors off with a really nice day on their home floor. Just what was the mindset going into this game against Pitt? Well, I've never had this many seniors. It was the longest senior day pregame ceremony in the history of Notre Dame basketball, and all of them have been such a key part uh, of our program. But then you want to win the game, mm -hmm. and, and you want to keep on moving toward a resume for the NCAA tournament and momentum for the ACC tournament. I thought that getting the two seed was going to be huge for your team. You had to still get this win with North Carolina and Duke playing later that night. It was important to get this. Also to finish 14-1 and one at home, your only loss against Duke. Just as a coach, when you protect home floor like that, what does that mean to you and say about your team? Well, that was the key for us, mm -hmm. to bounce back and, and be able to really handle business at home. You know, Duke put it on us here. Uh, but everybody else we took care of. And, and I think that gave us confidence. I can't say enough about our fans and our legion, our students helping us in the at end zone to, you know, to believe we should win home games. You guys ended up winning this game by 24 points. I want to go to the beginning and just talk about how this game played out. Cormac Ryan gave you 18 first half points. We're going to talk about him quite a bit here on this show because he finished the season so well, but in this game specifically, made his first five threes. You started to see him come alive this point of the year. In this game, Game, what impressed you most about him? You know, I think where Cormac changed the last 12 games of the season was he let offense come to him a little bit more. And when he had open shots, he took them instead of maybe over. He's always defended mm -hmm. and taken charges and made big plays. But I thought he put it together on the offensive end with a calmer tempo. And there was no guard better than Cormac Ryan the last 10, 12 games of the season in the country. <laughs> Another senior guard for you, Prentice Hub, had six assists, no turnovers. I just thought second half of the year, he played like his old self. He'd set such a tone for your team, protecting the basketball, also distributing it. For Prentice to finish his home career that way at Notre Dame, just what did that mean to you? Well, I think after a rough start to his senior year, Prentice understood these are my weapons around me mm -hmm. and I am gonna distribute. And then when they need me to make a big shot, I'll make every one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very proud of him. Very proud of the leadership he gave to Blake Wesley mm -hmm. as being his big brother throughout. Apprentice Hub maxed out his Notre Dame experience. In this game, you guys had 27 field goals. You assisted on 21 of them. I thought this year, when you guys get 20 assists, of course, but when you were really assisting on maybe two thirds of your baskets or more, that's when you guys were at your best. So what did you see from this team throughout the year? But in this game too, when the ball was moving, what allowed you to have so much success? You know, one of the things that was a joy to watch as the leader and the teacher and the coach was the unselfishness and our ability to pass. Mm -hmm. I think we were one of the best, if not the best passing team in the country. 
and it was beautiful. It's like a symphony. We made beautiful music together when we moved that ball. Very gratifying as the coach. Last thing to touch on for this team in this game, you had five players in double figures too. I always thought four or five guys in double figures, and we'll talk about it in the next game, how you only had a couple against Virginia Tech, but when you had four or five in double figures, that spoke to that same thing. When it wasn't one or two guys carrying the load, I thought that was when you're at your best as well. Yeah, I, I think we were at our best when we could get you know more guys involved. You know, our defense, came a long way mm -hmm. and it was there. But then it was a matter of the second half of the season, how can we score more? Mm -hmm. How can we get closer to 80 more consistently? And we were able to do that enough. When you finished off this game, you get the win by 25 points. You guys really did it handily. You got some guys off the bench at the end. I'm just curious, what's the locker room like after the final home game of the year? You know the rest of the games are gonna be on neutral floors. They're gonna be big games, but did you guys have time to reflect on what you accomplished this year and really what that day meant for the seniors? Yeah, I think you try and put a bow on it in that, you know, when I speak to them. First of all, I always want our seniors to go out on a good note. And I think overall we have on t over 22 years. Um, for them, all their families are there. They get to go out to dinner. It was an afternoon game, so you can go to dinner and enjoy it and talk about it. Of course, at that point, I think we're a lock for the NSA tournament. Evidently, we were on shakier <laughs> ground than I thought. But, you know, then you feel you have momentum going to uh, Brooklyn. So let's talk about the transition to Brooklyn, because I think you're right. You had a ton of momentum. You do lock up the two seed, and you're going out there, and, and earning the double bye is huge. It, it didn't pay off for you, but I do just want to know, going out to Brooklyn, you had the extra days to prepare. What was your mindset? What were you feeling like as you took the team out there? Because I thought this team was really prepared and was really hungry to go after an ACC championship. I, I was confident. They were confident. You know, we, we were going to play a Virginia Tech team that put it on us down in Blacksburg, and, you know, so you felt you owed them one, and, and just about every team we owed something to during the season we were able to pay back except for Virginia Tech we'll revisit that next season by the way um, but but we were confident now you know when you have the double buy and you go into New York on a Sunday night you're hanging around for a while before you play and we didn't get off to a very good start and we were digging out of a hole the whole time and you got to tip the cap to Virginia Tech, who later became the ACC champions. Yeah, let's talk about Virginia Tech. I was watching the night before. It was a great game against Clemson. They toss one in at the buzzer. I'm thinking, okay, it's a Clemson team you've beat twice this year. Virginia Tech's the next day. Like you said, I, I tried to go glass half full. I said, these guys owe them one. This is going to fire them up for the next day. But you as a coach, you're watching that and immediately have to flip into prepare mo pre preparation mode. What do they do that makes it so tough for you guys? They're clearly a tough matchup. They're really a tough matchup for us. First of all, it starts with those two bigs. Their two bigs are so physical and they're so good playing together inside the arc two on two. Mm -hmm. Yet you're afraid to help out off a perimeter guy because they shoot it so well. And of course they were two and seven at one point in the league and then when they found themselves you know, I think they were picked fourth or fifth. They're really good. I don't think it's a surprise they won the ACC. Other coaches in the league were like, yeah, that's kind of what we saw. And, and I had the utmost respect for them uh, knowing it was a tough matchup for us. But just the combination of both, they're good defensively. And we got off to a rough start. We had 10 fir first half turnovers. That's not like us, and, and that, that, just, that was too deep a hole to dig out of against a very good team. I was going to ask you about the first half because it just didn't look like you. You guys did a great job in the second half. We'll talk about it in a second. But the slow start, the, the high amount of turnovers, when you're looking at that, are you attributing that maybe to the long layoff? What, what did you see as a coach? What did you try to, try to put your finger on that was leading to those turnovers? Well, I think, you know, I always look at it and say, what could I have done better? We changed the starting lineup. I thought... Let's put Nate in, let's bring Dane off the bench. We thought about coming out differently. In hindsight, I'm not sure that was a great decision by the coach. Um, having said all that, our two guards, Blake and Prentice, who've been so good with the ball down the stretch, just weren't very good with the ball in the first half. And especially our senior guard. You know, when Prentice isn't good with it, it kind of hurts us and it gets contagious. I love that we fought back. I love that we gave ourselves a chance, but they're too good they were too old and too tough to get over the hump with. I want to follow up on Prentice because one thing I thought, he did turn the ball over, but I saw him in the first half. I think he looked around and he saw the offense wasn't quite clicking and, and maybe he was a part of that with some of the turnovers, but he took the scoring into his own hands, I think in a way we don't normally see in the first half. I got the sense that he sensed this game was kind of in a precarious spot and I thought he did a good job of keeping you within arm's reach with some big buckets there in the first half. And, and I think Prentice Hub's done that a lot throughout his career. He really wants to distribute but then he looks around and goes, uh, he's struggling, he's struggling, let me go. 
And some of them are forced, but we gotta try and make something happen. And he did keep us at least within reach. When you guys got into the halftime locker room in the situation you were, I believe you're down 11 points, you've got your guys, uh, Dane Goodwin, Blake Wesley, Paul Atkinson, who have carried you. You're three leading scorers. They just weren't getting it going offensively. They would turn it on a little bit in the second half, but what was the discussion like in the halftime locker room trying to get that team back in a position to come back in the game? And you don't want, you're like, fellas, we've been in this position a bunch. We've been in this position in the second half with 10 minutes to go, and we've finished. I said, so we gotta be better with the ball. Let's take better shots and let's see if we can guard. I think they had 41 points. You know, that's way too much. Mm -hmm. I think we only had one turnover in the second half, which we had a chance, but still it was too deep a hole. Yeah, you got it back to a six-point game at one point. You had a three from the right corner. I think everyone remembers it. Dane Goodwin had a oh, yeah. chance to make it a three-point game. I'm sure it's one he even still today yeah. wants back. It was a great look. Uh, your team made the run, and I think you didn't get the win in the end, but you had to have at least liked the way they fought in the second half. They did not wave the white flag in any way. Just what was your takeaway from the way they performed in the second half to try to get back in it? Yeah, I mean, this group has a lot of character and pride. Doug Collins, who I have the utmost respect for, called us great in grace. I thought that was a great name, theme for a group from a guy that's really respected in basketball. And, and they have grit. They fought. Uh, and then I think what you're trying to talk to them about after the game, as disappointed as we were, was, you know, now the real tournament comes. Mm -hmm. You flip that page real quick. You don't talk about that. And now here comes the real stuff. So, and let's use it as motivation. So let me ask you, and we'll talk about the, the three tournament games in the next segment, but when that final went down and, and you do lose in the opening round, did you think there was any chance you would be in the first four? I personally did not think that was possible. Second place team in the ACC. It's what happened. Were you mentally preparing for possibly having to go to Dayton at that point? I walked in the locker room and my athletic director, Jack Swarbrick, was there and I said, can we keep ourselves out of Dayton? And he was like, well, you know, they, I think we're okay. And, um, and, and I knew we were getting in. Like, you know, I know maybe we cut it close, but we were getting in. Um, but I wasn't sure. And I was mentally prepared by the time we got up in the air the next day back here. I was prepped for the talk of Dayton as a springboard mm -hmm. and not like, oh, we were in Dayton. Uh, and obviously we, uh, we, we really embraced it. We'll get a chance to talk about Dayton in the game against Rutgers in the first four of the NCAA tournament after this on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. Welcome back to Inside Notre Dame Men's Basketball presented by TireAct.com. It's time to continue our game breakdown. We now get a chance to talk about the best tournament in all of sports coach, March Madness. We talked about it a little bit in the last segment. You guys did not waste any time complaining about the fact you were in the first four. You had to embrace it and go to Dayton to take on a Rutgers team. As the head coach, just what were the vibes like in the days leading up as you got prepared for this NCAA tournament? Well, the most tension I've ever experienced was in my house at Selection Sunday because you know, everybody had, some people had us out. And, and when, when we did flash up, instead of jumping up and cheering, our guys were kind of like that cautious clap. And I said, fellas, we're okay, man, we're in. And I also had sheets made up, prepared for the first four to talk about teams that have springboarded UCLA to the final four last year and previous teams were gonna use it as a springboard. And thankfully, it was a quick prep. The next day, we were packed and rolled into Dayton on a bus. <laughs> we, we did bus there. It was, it was a fun experience, kind of old school. Like you said, get, get, awesome. the, get the vans going. You're going to the tournament. I thought this, and I think that I think you should have been in the first round of 64, but I will say this. Having never been there, that environment in that building in oh. Dayton is unbelievable. I, I can totally understand now why they have those games. It is incredibly exciting. Your team delivered, and we'll talk about the game in a second, but I just thought that building was an awesome experience for everyone involved. And that's why where the final four rotates, the first four will not. Mm -hmm. Dayton embraces it, the town embraces it, and you're right, the atmosphere in the building that night for our game was unbelievable. It, and I've been in some great atmospheres over 40 years in this profession. It was just fun, it was fabulous, and you're right, both teams were delivering. Let's talk about maybe the first moments in the locker room and just on the floor, because I think the storyline about this game coming in was the fact that you have an extremely veteran roster, but only one guy had played in the tournament before this, Paul Atkinson when he was at Yale. So what were you curious about? Because I know you said in a couple press conferences, hey, they had to prove it to themselves, to us, that they could do it in this environment. What were you looking for, whether it's in their eyes or in their demeanor on the first few trips, to, to see how they're handling the pressure? Well, you know, we, we talked about 
getting the bid for a year. Mm -hmm. And then I'm worried like, well, you know, we're not done just getting it right. We haven't achieved. And I challenged him a little bit the day before, like we're not, we're not just happy to be here, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. And again, I, I give a lot of credit to Cormac Ryan's, not only his play, but his leadership in March, starting with the NSA tournament that week. He was, he's always been a good voice, but he was really a powerful voice, keeping mm -hmm. us alive and driving us and talking at halftime and making us believe. And, uh, and I thought our old guys delivered. They all were like, hey, we're here and we're gonna play great on a big stage. We'll talk about some of the big plays he had and some others in the second half. Let's start first half though. I thought that both teams came out pretty well offensively. They looked really good. I think you guys were trying to figure them out. They have some great playmakers. Paul Atkinson though, led the way for you guys offensively, really kept you in it on that side of the floor. What impressed you about Paul's performance? Well, we felt we could go inside and Paul just had a fabulous year for us. And you know, we felt we could go in there to, to the credit of his teammates, we knew that was a weapon, and he was all over the place around the backboard and bouncing and scoring and doing his thing, and um, and and he he just embraced the atmosphere. There was no n nerves. It was like this is this is Broadway. Let's roll. <laughs> Second straight game though, you've allowed 41 points at the halftime locker room. So I'm wondering what the conversation was in there. I imagine defense has been a huge emphasis for you all year. Now you're in the postseason. You're not quite getting the stops the way you're accustomed to. You would flip the script defensively in the second half. Much better performance. So what was the talk like in the locker room at halftime? Well, you challenge them defensively. And again, I didn't have to say much. You know, when you have great leadership, Cormac Ryan and Prentice Hub we're already addressing that when I got in there. And it's much more powerful when it's coming from the leaders. And that was so neat about this group, not only in the NSA tournament, but throughout the year. Um, but I also said at the halftime interview, we're gonna probably have to score to get out of here tonight. And I thought we were gifted enough offensively to escape. The scoring came alive. Dane Goodwin came alive as well. I thought he gave you a big and one there, maybe midpoint of the second half. It gave you the five-point lead. So you took this five-point deficit. You flipped the script on them a little bit, really locked down defensively. Dane getting to the glass to give you an and one. You're up five now. What are you thinking as a coach as your team now has a chance to possibly put this away in regulation? Well, you know, I mean, you know, you're, you're feeling good down the stretch. Harper makes, when he banks the three, <laughs> Then I'm thinking to myself, well, the basketball gods do not want us to win. You know, I've been in this game long enough. You know, on the, on the flip side, Prentice has made some of those where you go, we're gonna win. He made a bad three. Um, but yet we weathered mm -hmm. all kinds of great plays by Rutgers to hang on and, and, and just keep playing until the buzzer went off. Let's talk end of regulation. I thought it was really interesting. Nate Leszewski got a big offensive rebound to give you a lead. They came down and scored. This is when I think, when I see big basketball games, what I actually see happen all the time is there's actually not a lot of scoring late because it gets so tight. There were no field goals made in the final two minutes of regulation. They got a couple looks at the basket late in the first regulation from some guys that have hit huge shots in Baker and Harper. You mentioned Harper would hit the big ones later. As you're watching on the sideline, are you thinking, gosh, if they put one in here, it's all over. Yeah. And, and it's funny how who can really make them then, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, that that's, you know, and I thought our defense was great. Um, actually, Cormac Ryan's defense uh, on Baker was unbelievable. Uh, and really, Blake Wesley's defense from Harper was great. He just made really hard shots. Um, but I thought that we were defending and we were getting confident defensively. And, you know, we were going to be able to maybe get something good on the other end. I'm curious about a couple of huddles. The first one is between regulation and overtime. You're tied at 69. You're in this environment that everybody's been looking forward to. And I'm thinking as a head coach, are you leaning back on, you know, whether it was five overtime here or NCAA tournament there to tell the guys, hey, you may not have ever been there. I have. Here's what we need to do here going into this extra five minutes. Well, I, I, my biggest thing was I thought they were getting fatigued. Mm -hmm. You know, they shortened their rotation. And I don't know if their main guys have played that many minutes. Our guys have. I thought our, I said our conditioning. Now, I believe part of that, but also there was some psychological. And I said, fellas, let's just keep playing till the horn goes off. We can play longer. Just keep playing. They're going to get tired. And it's a little bit more of convincing them mentally that we're going to finish this somehow. It did seem like your team just 
kept believing they were going to get it done. I think a play that's so illustrative of that is that he, Harper hits the big three to make it 76-75. You come down, you don't get the basket, ball goes off of Blake Wesley's foot out of bounds. There's 28.2 seconds left. They're inbounding on this side of the floor. I was thinking, okay, you got to trap, you don't, but I, I was saying, you don't have to foul right away. So I assume the message was, hey, let's trap this and that. And then of course you get the, the high pass, Cormac makes the steal and gets it to go. But what was the message as a coach in that situation? And what'd you like about your team's execution? Well, you're exactly right, Tony. Diamond is our press. And we, we kind of say in that situation, let's get one good trap. If we don't steal it out of the trap, it's red right away. Red means foul. We got we to have the ball or the clock, red. And Cormac Ryan makes a play that will go down in history like a Rex Fluger tip-in to go to the Sweet 16. That play, and it's very fitting that he made the play because nobody would, he was willing us in the huddles the whole time with his play that we are gonna get there. And it's one of the great plays in the history of our program. So it gives you a one point lead. Rutgers now, I think they have to, they call timeout just to settle down because they're probably shaken up. They trail by one, there's 19 seconds left. Tell me about what you're talking about in this huddle because they ultimately came down and knocked down a three. You know, it, you're, you're talking about let's defend, let's dig in. Like, hey fellas, we've been getting stops. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we get a stop, we're going to San Diego. Mm -hmm. It was real simple. We get a stop, we're going to San Diego. And then they throw the three in. <laughs> now, to our credit, you know, we kept playing. Uh -huh. And, you know, we didn't want to call timeout. If it's four or under, we call timeout. Okay. That's our rule, because the clock stops, you can look up. Chaos benefits the offense. Uh -huh. And to come down and get that dribble exchange where Blake turns the corner. How about Prentice? Unbelievable. Presence of mind, dribble exchange, layup, and it benefited us. We were able to be calm and chaos better than them. I was going to ask, because we've talked about it throughout the year, the, the timeout decisions. We've even broken it down on Irish Intel here. 8.6 left. There was no hesitation. They looked to the bench a little bit. They, walk, they let the ball get up to half court, which I thought was smart, save a little bit of time. But as you said, this team, and you've said it all year, they've been in a lot of game situations. Prentice, without hesitation, drove the ball, gave it to Blake, and said, hey, freshman, you can get to the rim. Go get us to double OT. As a coach, I just have to imagine, you guys put them through situations in practice. They've been in it through games. To see them execute like that without the timeout, just what goes through your head as you reflect back on really what was, I think, incredible execution in the highest leverage moment of the entire season? Well, as a coach, again, it's very gratifying to see a group be poised and know who they are when the lights are brightest and it's crunch time. And you gotta give Prentice Hub credit to understand if I can get a little momentum for my young guy, he can turn the corner better than any of us and get to the rim. But you know, you call a time out there, you set up a play and everybody gets robotic. Mm -hmm. You gotta be a basketball player. And as I said, I think it always benefits the offense when it's chaotic. Before it went to double OT, we've seen Harper hit some crazy shots this year. He'd already hit, already hit one in this game. I thought about Purdue. As he got to midcourt, you had a pretty good look at uh, it. It was down the line. It was a little strong. Were you thinking, oh no, this is it? Well, I'm thinking <laughs> he banked one. If he, if he throws this one in, you know, I'm going right to Miami and, <laughs> and I'm getting on a jet to Miami, you know. Um, but you know, again, that was a hard shot, and we lived to play another five minutes. So in the in that timeout, you're getting ready for double OT. Now you got to be looking at. I mean, what are you telling them now? Because you're saying the same thing, like, "Hey, we're just going to outlast him, whatever it takes." We're kind of laughing a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. I, I, I and this is a little bit of a page from the book of the five overtime game, where I would come in and go, "This is awesome, <laughs> isn't this great?" And they're looking at me like, and it, and it kind of relaxes them a little bit, like, "This is unbelievable." Let's just keep. Hey, we'll play another five, and you know what? If we got to play. If we got to play three more overtimes, we're in better shape. Mm -hmm. We're in better shape. They're tired. They're exhausted. We'll talk about Paul's game-winning basket in a second, but in a stretch here in overtime, he got three consecutive hoops, a tip dunk. He got one on the baseline. Seems like in the second overtime, after maybe not going to him as much in the second half or first overtime, you really got the ball to Paul, and he gave you some huge plays late in, in double OT. He, he was fabulous. Uh, I'm so proud of him, and he gave us a great year, and he will move on with his career as, as he should. He got his master's degree. He's going to go to Portsmouth and work out and start his pro career. But uh, you talk about maxing out a one-year opportunity. Um, I am thankful, as I told Paul Atkinson, thanks for all you did for our program. He believed and kind of felt 
I can do this and, and gave us confidence. Prentice Hub hit two free throws that might get lost to all the chaos at the end that gave you a three-point lead, 87-84. We've talked about it all year. I think he ended the year 72%. I'm convinced he was 98% in the final four minutes of regulation in overtime. So he gave you the three-point lead. Then they come down, and Harper hits another incredible shot to tie the game with 22 seconds left. Once again, you don't call timeout. So just talk me through that whole sequence yeah. and what's going through your head. Well, Hub probably, not only is he 98%, I don't think they hit any rim. Mm -hmm. It's all cord. Nobody makes pressure free throws better than Prentice Up. We don't foul. We want that clock to run, and we're in what we call green. Okay. Green is our anti-three-point defense. Switch everything, get out. And, of course, there was an amazing illegal screen, but nobody's calling that yeah. right there. I mean, Blake got totally wiped out, and he gets a really good look but I just didn't want to foul because that's not what we've done. Of course, when it goes in, I go, maybe we should have practiced fouling. Mm -hmm. And again, you get it to your guy up top, our guy that can turn the corner. Pinch is when our two bigs come up mm -hmm. and get two ball screens. We got shooters on the X's for spacing. The one guy that can get the ball to the rim and, and create rotation is Blake Wesley, and he did and Paul's there to clean it up. I was gonna ask about what you just alluded to, because I think this gets lost sometimes when the ball doesn't go in. We saw Blake put the ball in in the first overtime and we were talking about it, rightfully so. In the second OT though, as you said, he's still the guy. Even though the ball does not go in, Paul makes a great play on the rebound. It's Blake's ability, in my eyes, to get down the lane and just sometimes getting it up there is as valuable as anything, and I thought that was huge for you guys. That should be an assist. <laughs> it, it was a missed shot, but it should be an assist because what he did, and he did it all year, he caused help. Paul's man had to rotate to try and block the shot, which left a clean lane for Paul to get the offensive rebound and put back. So Blake is our best candidate to turn the corner. Thankfully, his teammates knew that. 1.4 seconds left. I just been bringing this up because you mentioned it. If you have it drilled, 1.4 in your head, we gotta use that timeout. Rutgers did not, I think, because you said, there's chaos, it's hard to do it there. You can see Steve Peichel was trying to call it. Well, Kehi, I looked at the film, he was trying to call it, but yeah. they got it in because again, you're just in that environment and they couldn't slow the game down then. They put the shot up, it doesn't go, and the game goes final. I just have to know, being on the sidelines, being a part of that, what goes through your uh, mind? What are you thinking about? Because it was unlike anything I've ever been a part of. Well, it's just an emotional roller coaster, and it's unbelievable that you get to be part of it. When Paul's shot went in, I looked up, and I know the clock stops, and I'm going, you know, let's, let's just be set. And our, to our credit, three of our five guys didn't celebrate. Two maybe did a little bit. Mm -hmm. Three kind of turned around and knew this ball's going to get in, and I maybe just get in the way of somebody. Mm -hmm. And it, it is discouraging, I've been on the other side, the Rutgers side, you're so kind of heartbroken right there that you know you throw it in and you don't really believe. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's another one in the air and I'm going, come on now. <laughs> and as it's in the air, I see, I actually can see it's offline. I'm going, San Diego, here we come. Reverse red eye to San Diego. <laughs> what was the locker room like? What was the, I mean, it just, it just I heard, let's do it this way. You were talking to John Rothstein and you called it the best game you've ever been a part of. You've had a long career. Yeah. We're here today, a couple weeks later, we can have some perspective now. Do you still consider it the best I, game? I, I think it is. You know, the five overtime game against Louisville was unbelievable, but the stakes weren't the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. um, the win in the ACC championship game against North Carolina, we came roaring back and went by them. But the plays that kids made on both teams and the lead changes and the punches and the atmosphere, the first four, we just got in, two 11 seeds. Can they advance? Do they deserve to be in the tournament? Mm -hmm. The stakes, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, I think it's my best basketball experience, even two weeks later. It was unbelievable to be a part of. I think that the thing that stuck out to me, and we'll, we'll turn to Alabama here after this, but I just thought that they did everything you were curious about whether or not they could do. They showed up to the tournament having never been there except for Paul, and they made those shots in the biggest game of their career, uh, the, maybe the most impressive game you've been a part of. Like when you were on the plane, I know you had to focus for Alabama, and, and here we are two weeks later. Did you get a chance to reflect on, man, they answered the call in that moment? Yeah, because I thought the Duke game, the lights were bright, there was a buildup, it was a little much for us. Even the ACC tournament, lights were bright, the buildup, maybe a little much for us. I was concerned, mm -hmm. we delivered. We delivered and again, you're proud of your seniors because 
they got us in the tournament and we advanced. You get to San Diego, as you said, travel just couldn't be uh, less convenient, I suppose, but just like with Dayton, you guys embraced it. I didn't hear a single player complain about it. You were at the podium, let a second press conference in the same day on St. Patrick's Day. Everyone embraced it. What did you like about the way your team prepared in that 40 hour span? You're just on such an adrenaline high that you don't know how tired you're all, you are till it ends after the Texas Tech game. To be out there, first of all, to be in San Diego weather, mm. that certainly refreshed you and, and that helped us. But, you know, we did use it as a springboard to believe. There's no question about it. Your team got off to a really good start. Alabama, I thought, hit you with a run that made it 25-21 or 21-17 at one point. I thought it could get dicey. Your team did a great job just responding every time with, with punch, with counter punch. What impressed you most about the way your team came out in that first half, considering, hey, they could be a little bit gassed after this? They certainly didn't look like it. No, we were, you're playing on fumes then, and, and we got them rested and recovered and iced them down all day Thursday. And, you know, we really believed. And, again, I think Cormac Ryan's play – of getting us out of the gate and making the big plays defensively uh, against State, he was gonna not, he was not gonna let us lose. And we kind of all kind of rode off of him there offensively. He had a career high, 29 points, career high, seven three-pointers. I know against Duke, of course, last year in an empty camera and he had 28, but this is on a different level. I mean, as he was doing it, some of the shots he was putting in were just otherworldly. They were high contests in front of the bench. What's going through your head when you see someone this hot? You know, I, I, he is so pure in his belief of leading and wanting to win and playing right. He's a throwback. Mm. I, I love coaching him, and I'm so excited that he will be our main voice and captain next season because he will have everyone by the throat all season, including the coach. But he was dragging us with, and it was like, we are advancing, and we're going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I thought... Again, his offensive play early, he's always good defensively. His offensive play early really made all of us believe and our crowd believe. We had a great crowd out there too. Let's talk about one other player. We really haven't talked much here in this postseason run who I thought was so good for you in the first two games, and that's Nate Leshesky. In the two games combined between the first four and this uh, opening round, 64, he was 9 for 12, averaged 14 points, so averaged more points than shots taken in the first two games. He just, I thought, as the year went along too, maybe quieter than Cormac, really let the season come to him. It, it, he really did. And, you know, we were bringing him off the bench after the injury. He was like, Coach, we just want to win, man. Mm -hmm. He is fabulous defensively and always there. His shooting percentage, how he played, I thought he became a better passer this year. Um, just a, a, a solid, rock solid guy who was part of a fabric of a group that wanted to win and play together and play right. It is so, it's just, just so cool as the leader to see a group embrace it and, and, and own themselves. Final eight minutes or so, Blake Wesley, I thought really put the game away. Yeah. With his defense leading to offense, got to the rim in a way that only he can. Just that second half, we really kind of took the game and, and put it out of reach from Alabama. What impressed you most in those eight or nine minutes? Well, the one thing we've learned about Blake Wesley is, you know, you, you, you just got to give him some rope to play and not overcoach him. And I thought he's done a great job of not settling for bad jump shots and threes and get into the basket. Mm -hmm. And we kind of ran some sets there where we just said, go make a play, and, and he did. And then his steal was kind of, like they're coming down with momentum. Yeah. And he steals it and dunks it, and it's over mm -hmm. right there. It's the only guy in the building that could make that play. So you get the win and you advance to this round of 32. Now you've really got momentum on your side. You've yeah. kind of captured the imagination of a lot of Irish fans. What were you guys talking about in the locker room as then you had to also get ready for a really tough Texas Tech team? Well, you, you, know, you know it's going to be a different kind of game because the, how they defend. And one of the things on the Saturday we talked about was let's be ready. Is it okay if we go to San Francisco if we win 53-52? Because we're not going to score 80. Your offense is not going to come easy. You're going to get held and grabbed and pushed. Can we guard enough and hang in there? And, and we did. Yeah. We, we really, really did. Um, we just, they made a few more plays uh, than us down the stretch. And, and as I told you earlier in the show, when you come in the locker room and you're emotionally and physically drained and you're laying on the floor and... We've got six or seven guys crying their eyes out. 
We emptied the tank, man. That's all I can ask. I thought your team made some huge plays down the stretch. We don't hit them all, but Dane Goodwin hit a huge three late. You get to the line. There's a couple guys that leave some free throws on the line they'd probably want. But as you said, when you get as the head coach, all that's going on and you're in the locker room. Just what's the message you try to, to give them at the end that, that threads the line of like, hey, we could have done it. You guys were good enough to make the Sweet 16. You know that, and it didn't quite go your way but we have to be grateful for what we accomplished. Yeah, it, it, that, that's a tough locker room, and I've had to handle some of those because one thing about the NSA tournament, it ends fast. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the ride is over. And so after talking about Texas Tech, you talk a little bit about my theme was, it was an honor to coach you. And I've only said that three or four times, and I love all the groups that I've had, don't get me wrong, but some you can say, it was a flat out honor to coach you. And, and then you start to talk about next season mm. and you start with the recruiting pitch of, well, let's get a good group back and try and go to a Final Four. So, you know, nothing was lost on me on the moment right there. We will talk about the future after this on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. It's now time for this week's edition of Irish Intel. Coach, we're going to go inside a couple of plays from the Pittsburgh game. Final regular season game of the year when I thought you guys executed really well. This is a nice little pick and pop set. It's going to start with Cormac off the inbound set. He's going to set up Nate Lashesky for the three. Out of bounds under. We really executed this year, but nice probe by Cormac. We step back and find a Nate Lashevsky, and my man was only shooting about 60% from the three-point line with his feet set. But it all started with out of bounds under, which our philosophy is try and score try and score on an out-of-bounds under. I was just going to ask about your out-of-bounds this year because I did think that, and you pointed out a lot on these segments, you've had a lot of looks. What is it about this team that allowed them to execute so well? Because everyone runs these baseline inbound sets, and I just thought you guys were scoring on them at a lot higher rate. Basketball IQ, um, we ran a lot of stuff for Dane. I don't know how many times he scored on an out-of-bounds under. And then when they started to scout that and cheat it, we slipped screens and got dunks. And this is a little bit of a different entry, but it's a group that knows who they are, and knows that our philosophy is let's try and score. So, Coach, this is now again in the pit game. You guys have a nice lead here, but I thought some really good ball movement. The ball starts on the block with Dane Goodwin, and then it rotates around for a Cormac three. This is great movement and playing the right way. We post Dane, which is something good. He kicks out. Paul with a pass over. Cormac, great spacing. If you notice in this, watch Nate Lashevsky's cut. That sets up the Cormac open look. Hmm. Kick, cut drags all the defense, and that's something we stress. You know, when you when in doubt, cut. This goes back to basketball IQ, right? Because this is just a feel play where, you know, you can see all the, all the action, but it's really you're telling me that Nate senses the moment, I'm going to cut here, and that's going to open up this corner three. And Cormac staying over there and keeping that spacing. It's a group that knows who they are and played together and played the right way. It's a cocky offensive group right here. Kick, swing, cut, step up and hit it, another assist. Coach, one more play here to break down in the pit game. Again, you're going to work out of the post. This time it's Paul who's going to back his way down and find Blake Wesley who cuts, and nobody really picks him up. Yeah, they, they do a great job. Paul does a great job, and he did this all year. He gets doubled a little bit, and what a feel for the game by Blake, cutting and finishing. Another assist on a 20-assist night, but a good spacing. We've got good spacing, right? And all of a sudden a great cut when a guy turns his head. That's just a group that's – Playing the right way offensively, Tony. Something we talked about here, I just want to ask about it, because you brought it up the last possession in this one, too. There's so much, uh, I think, focus on how good you guys are shooting around the perimeter, but it seems like a lot of the baskets, whether it's that layup there or the cut you pointed out earlier, it really starts with the motion away from the ball, draw the attention, and that opens up the great looks. You know, making a great pass is unselfish. Making a great cut is also unselfish, because mm -hmm. you know you probably aren't going to get it, but you move the defense. And I like showing edits of great cuts as much as edits of great passes. That does it for this week's edition of Irish Intel. When we come back, we'll have Irishography on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. Now time for this week's Irishography, and we're joined by assistant coach Ryan Humphrey. Coach, I got to ask you now that you've had some time to have the season digest. The fact that you guys finished second in the ACC, you win a couple of NCAA tournament ma games, make a great run. Just as a coach, when you reflect on this year, what comes to mind, and what are you most satisfied with? Well, it was a great year. You know, anytime you finish and go to the NCAA tournament, and you're a minute away from advancing to the next round. You think about different things you could have did differently, but as a group and as a staff. We've talked about it, and we're happy with, you know, the guys and the effort that they gave us. 
I want to ask about that last minute you talked about because I didn't really get a chance to talk to Coach Bray too much about the Texas Tech game. When you're in a game that close and you know you're good enough to make the Sweet 16, how difficult is it to maybe focus on the positives at times when you know you could have possibly made it to that second week? I think, you know, you can always look at things you could have did differently, but you also, with the group that we've had, think about things that, you know, we can build on. You know, we've got different guys coming back next year and say, okay, these are certain areas that we can focus on and do better at. I want you to go back, if you can, to the summer. I know there was a lot of focus around really retooling the defense and just getting this team to get back to the tournament for the first time in five years. When you think about the stuff you guys focused on and you did see the team get back to the tournament, what are you most proud of as a coach that you guys are able to implement and then see it executed on the floor? You know, it was a situation throughout the year where, you know, we were up and down and our guys bought in and did everything we asked them to do as far as our defense collectively and as individuals. And they bought in and it got us to where we got, you know, throughout the season. You mentioned getting excited for next year. I think there's a lot of excitement around this team because of how well they performed this year. So as a coach, I'm sure you're already thinking ahead to how you can build. What are the things you're going to focus on to try to take this team to the next level in this upcoming offseason? You know, just keeping our defense, but also, you know, there's a couple of guys that need to get better. Not just a couple of guys, but a whole, whole locker room needs to get better. You know, individual skill work, getting stronger, bigger, and faster. I want to ask you about the role as an assistant coach. I think in college basketball or college athletics, obviously there's so much focus on the head coach and and rightfully so, but as an assistant, you know, what's your focus on specifically as we come up on the off season? I know a lot of work goes in with individuals to make sure they're in the right position to properly improve over the off season. So as an assistant coach, what do you focus on on a day to day throughout the off season? You know, our staff has been great. You know, you think about it, Anthony Solomon, Coach Weiss, you know, everybody that's been a part of our staff, Coach Rogers, um, Scott Martin, you know, obviously Coach Bray, you know, I, I think our synergy has been great. We've worked together and we've built, and now our next step is say, okay, what are different areas that each guy is going to try to tackle individually and collectively and just make this thing keep moving? I want to ask you just about your experience with Notre Dame, and I'm sure you talk about this with current players, maybe prospective players, former players, just having coached here, having played here. When you think about Notre Dame, what is this – place had as an impact on you. When you think about this place, how special is it to you? Uh, it's special. You look at our staff. It starts with Coach Bray, you know, Coach Solomon. Both of those guys coached me when I was here. And now to be able to work alongside of those guys, me and Coach Weiss have known each other, and just being able to be a, a family. You know, people use the word family loosely, but I've known, you know, most of our coaching staff over 20 plus years. And now to be able to walk through these halls and, and coach this next group of guys and say, okay, hey, it's bigger than these four or five years and possibly six years that you're here. It, it's going to extend long past. The, the last thing I wanted to ask you is just about Coach Bray. Uh, obviously, you've worked with him as a coach, as a player. But just what has he meant to you uh, as you've developed your career? You know, he, he's been a mentor, a friend, someone that I can bounce personal ideas off of, professional ideas off of. And, and, you know, he's, I joke around with people, he got me paid twice. You know, he got me drafted, now I'm working for him. But, you know, he, he's a great guy. And people say, hey, what is Coach Bray like? He's never met a stranger. Mm. You know, he, he has that ability to make everyone that he comes in contact with feel special. Always keep the people that pay you twice close to you. Very much so. <laughs> All right, Coach, appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. That does it for this week's Irishography. When we come back, we'll look ahead on The Mike Bray Show, presented by TireAct.com. Coach, I think about this season, 24 wins, huge win at home here over Kentucky. You finish second in the ACC. You make a great March Madness run. Just when you reflect on the season as a coach, what are you most proud of and what will you think of when you think of 2021, 2022? You know, your goal is always to have a group take ownership of itself. And we have been fortunate around here that almost every year our leadership has done that. This year, it was unbelievable how they owned it. They had clear team goals. They played right. You did not have to overcoach them. Rewarding would be the word I would use as their teacher. Should have also mentioned you beat a Final Four team in North Carolina <laughs> earlier this year as well. A uh, couple of guys that are going to move on, Prentice Hub and Paul Atkinson. Yeah. Pren Prentice has been here four years, has had a great career at Notre Dame. Paul gave you a great year after three at Yale. As they move on and you think about their contributions to Notre Dame, what do you reflect on? Well, Prentice, even though he would have a year of eligibility, sometimes it's time to go on and become a man in the next challenge. He gave us everything he had. He's like a son to me. I will miss him, but it's time. And then you got to kick the son out of the house sometimes and say, grow up and be a man. He will move on with a professional career. Paul Atkinson really has no eligibility left. There is no rule that's going to help him with that. There's been talk of it. I don't think it's ever going to get done. He's been invited to Portsmouth. 
which is a great uh, showcase for his ability. He has a master's degree from Notre Dame, an undergrad from Yale. It is also time mm -hmm. to leave the house and become a man. And we thank both of them for everything that they've done. It is hard to imagine you generating more momentum going into next year based on the season you just had. All the accolades we just talked about, the great run, a lot of excitement. We can get into the details of who's going to be on the roster down the road. But as the head coach, when you think about what you accomplished this year, what you have in front of you, what excites you most about next season? Well, I think it's a group that tasted the NSA tournament and now can actually talk about, what about a Final Four? What about playing all the way mm -hmm. to the Final Four? And that's realistic. If you haven't tasted it, that's not a realistic locker room talk, and I can't talk about that. I think Cormac Ryan and Dane Goodwin will talk about that a lot all summer, and that's a good thing. Coach, appreciate the time this week and all season. It was a blast covering this team and working with you. Looking forward to next year as well. Great first year, Tony. <laughs> next season, see you, buddy. Go Irish. Go Irish. That does it for this week and this year's Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com.